You know, Rebels, if you've been checking out some of my promotional ads on social media, you will be aware that I have been using a lot of AI programs to help me create ads. But you know what? There's a lot more uses for AI than just funny little videos. And I'd like to introduce one of our new sponsors, Podium. It is a leader in creating AI tools for podcasters. Now, let's say you've got a podcast and maybe you're even thinking of doing a podcast. You're probably wondering, well, how can AI be integrated with your workflow? I'll tell you about Podium. As a podcaster, you know that writing show notes and creating chapters and transcribing episodes takes a lot of time and it can cost you a lot of money too. But you know what? That's where Podium comes in. It's an AI tool designed specifically for creators and podcasters with the goal of making post-production tasks quick and easy. And in just a few minutes, Podium generates show notes, chapters, summaries, clips for social media, a full transcript, suggested episode titles, social media posts, and more. Whew, that's a lot of work for one little program. You're your show notes are key to your podcast success because it helps new listeners find your podcast and they'll know if it's a fit for them. You know, it's kind of like too many podcasts. It also improves your SEO. That's your search engine optimization. Ooh, big phrase there. And overall accessibility. And with Podium, you can focus on creating a great podcast and let Podium's AI do the heavy lifting. But Podium isn't just for solo creators and podcasters. It's a game changer for editors, producers, marketers, agencies, and production studios. Teams that use Podiums are able to increase workloads, decrease turnaround times, and improve their quality. How does it work? Very easy. First, go to Podium's website, and you'll see that link that's right there in the show notes. You get three hours free just to try it. Pretty cool, huh? And using that link also supports this show as well. And you know what else happens? Because I'm a good guy. You use my link, you will get 50% off for your first month. So visit the site, upload an MP3 file, and download your files, and that's it. And if you need anything else, you can use Podium GPT to generate articles and any marketing copy you might need in seconds, instant show notes, transcripts, chapters for your podcast or channel. This will level up that podcast. So check out Podium today. The Sherpa Screening Room is a presentation of Too Many Podcasts, which is brought to you in cooperation with the SJ Network. If you're someone who'd like to appear on podcasts, contact Stephen Joyner at s-j-network.com. This show is hosted by Jim the Podcast Sherpa. With a name like that, you can't say I didn't warn you. This week in the Sherpa Screening Room, it's an interview with NASA scientist Tanya Rogers. Tanya is always hard at work making the air in space safer to breathe, as well as the air here on Earth. If I can offer a suggestion to make the air better on Earth, let's keep the Sherpa from making his quote unquote world famous cabbage and black bean cake. Coming to you from Sherpa Chalet in beautiful downtown Mount Podcastia, it's time for entertainment interviews in the Sherpa Screening Room. Grab an aisle seat and a bucket of popcorn, but don't crunch too loud or you'll miss the show. Now, here's your host, Jim, the podcast Sherpa. Hello there, Rebels of the Sharp Revolution. Welcome to the Sharper Screening Room. It is a presentation of Too Many Podcasts, the podcast about podcasts, and so much more. Jim, the podcast Sherpa, coming to you from Sharper Lou Studios in the Sharper Chalet, high atop Mount Podcastia. And for those of you who are new to the show, hello. You may not know that on these episodes, we get to talk to creators very often, like writers, actors, singers, dancers, and also, people who are just plain old interesting and have got really interesting occupations. And that's what this episode is about. I'll let you in on a little secret. Very often when people are talking to me, they go, oh, you're so smart. You're like a rocket scientist, aren't you? Today's interview, I am actually speaking with a scientist from NASA. Her name is Tanya Rogers. She's living down in Texas, and that's where she works on the Space Coast. I like that. And we got to know her and her story, how she ended up in NASA, and not only about her life in NASA and career, and not only that, a side project that she's working on, which is a Kickstarter project that you can get involved in if you are interested in saving the environment. You know, that little thing called the environment, because she's working on a really interesting project. And we got to talk about that during the interview as well. This is a really fascinating scientific 
interview, and I managed to hold my own. She actually said I was thinking like a scientist, which kind of scared me for a little bit, but I got past it. I was good. I was good. But anyway, uh, we will move on, and let's listen to my conversation with NASA scientist Tanya Rogers. Hello there, Rebels. We are here for a different kind of episode of the Sherpa Screening Room. My guest today is coming to us from the Space Coast of Texas. Not the Space Coast, the Space Coast. And she is a scientist for NASA by daytime. And at night, she is running a startup to help fight climate change. And she is graciously accepted to be on the show. And we can kind of get to know her and ask her some kind of wacky questions. Her name is Tanya Rogers. Tanya, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. I'm excited to be here. Although when you said not Space Ghost, I I got a little sad as a fan of Space Ghost Coast to Coast. That was a childhood (laughs) favorite of mine, but that's okay. I'll, I'll forgive you. So maybe when you go into work tomorrow, you can go Space Coast. I do that more times than I should, and I have no shame about it. I love it. I love it. Keep the pop culture alive in the NASA community. Exactly. So how exactly did you end up in NASA? Was this a plan? Was this something that you were, were you studying science or were there circumstances that kind of like where a light came on and you said, you know what, this is what I'm going to do? Oh, none of this was planned. So if you're hoping for some inspirational story, buckle up. I I will say it, it was a bit all over the place. I... People are surprised to find out I am a high school dropout. So I kind of had to build myself from the ground up. I realized very quickly that wasn't going to get me far in life. So I started working as a waitress and attending night classes to get a GED Mm -hmm. and slowly moved up the ladder, went to community college first got an associate's degree. Then I transferred to a four-year university, failed out of that. I have some health issues that kind of got in the way there, and I I figured out how to deal with those. Finished my four-year university. Along the way, I discovered I like science. I kind of always like science, but where I come from, you don't really dream of working at NASA. You, mm-hmm. you, you're in survival mode. I grew up in a very poor background, a lot of chaos and turbulence around me. So we, we were just focused on if you made it out of high school, that was the big accomplishment. And I didn't even do that. <laughs> so okay. at, that, at that point, it wasn't looking good. But once I realized this could be a possibility for me, I started exploring it. And the NASA thing was all by happen chance. I was studying in the library late at night. There was somebody who said free food. And when you're a college student or really anybody end stage of life, your ears just, you gravitate to whatever the free food was. Yep. Yep. So I went to that room and it wasn't, it wasn't college pizza. It was proper fajitas and all the Texas fixings. Okay. (laughs) And I was talking to this woman And we started talking about Richard Feynman and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Carl Sagan and all these phenomenal science figures. And she looks at me as I'm stuffing a a taco down my face (laughs) and says, you know, this was great. I'd love to have you come in for an official interview. And I I hadn't even stopped to look around or take in where I was at or what I was doing beyond the fajita buffet. (laughs) And I was actually at a NASA recruitment session. So the next day I went and I landed an internship. This was about 10 years ago. And it kind of all grew from there. I stuck around. I got a full-time job out of it. At some point during the path, I ended up going to graduate school and got a PhD just to really hone in on my science skills. Mm -hmm. And it's landed me to where I am now, still working there, still happy, still walking the hallways, going, space ghost. (laughs) (laughs) And that's that's where this journey has taken me. Wow. When you actually did start in NASA, was it kind of like you expected it to be? Were you thinking like of all those old time movies where there's that mission control office? And there's a bunch of guys with buzz cuts and horn rim glasses. I had no expectations. <laughs> And it's actually, there. there's still some of that. There's still a lot of that. Okay. <laughs> you still have a lot of people who have been there since the space shuttle days. They deeply remember Challenger. They deeply remember Columbia. Mm-hmm. And a lot of NASA history is, is embedded in the people that walk those hallways. 
And when you walk inside a mission control, you still see people with buzz cuts and pocket protectors. And it's so neat to see. Of course, you see a new generation as well, where they're a little more relaxed with their fashion style choices. Right. So it's a it's a cool mix, I think. Well, what exactly do you do? I mean, what what do they uh, put you in like specific projects? Can you are you allowed to talk about this or some of this stuff like top secret? Oh, they do. I can I can talk about some of it. Okay. I've always been drawn to doing something about the environment. Okay. And when I was in my early 20s, I was young and ambitious and I had no idea what that was. I just knew I wanted to do something about the environment. NASA actually has a lot of the same challenges with keeping humans alive in space mm-hmm. that we do here on have on planet Earth. If you think about it, what are the basic necessities of human life? You need clean air, clean water, food, oxygen to breathe. None of that changes just because you go inside of a rocket ship and land somewhere else. Uh, That is true. Yeah. So I've been working on developing those technologies for the past 10 years, ways to get water clean on the space station. I like to tell students, and depending on the age, you get different reactions. My favorite is fifth uh, five-year-olds because they go, ew, <laughs> but astronauts drink their own pee. <laughs> and, and of course it's not, you know, directly from out to in. They right. go through the whole process. We clean it. We remove, we remove all the bacteria, the volatiles, the things you don't want going back inside of your body. Right. And that technology is pretty hard. It's not as simple as it might sound on the surface. So I've gotten the opportunity to work on that. I've worked on carbon dioxide in the space station, you and I and every human, we are breathing CO2 producing machines. We exhale, breathe out about a kilogram of CO2 a day. When you're on the space station, which is basically a giant submarine in space, you can't just open the door and let the CO2 out. That's a bad day. <laughs> yeah, that might be making things a little tricky. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not the preferred option. And you have to do something about that because if the CO2 levels start building up, there's tons of scientific reports and literature and even astronauts reporting just changes in the way your cognitive skills are, getting headaches. And so we use technologies on the space station to scrub or remove that CO2 from the air and turn it into something helpful. So I've got gotten a chance to work on stuff like that over the years and in the recent year, I gravitate a little more towards environmental technology for the moon. And that's the stuff I can't really dive into yet. But right. there's a lot of fun stuff on the internet about the Artemis mission and lunar power grids and lunar robots and all the things you read in sci-fi movies we're actually doing. Was there, I mean, I don't know if, if you can, if you can't answer this, that's that's okay. Was there something that was like the driving force between, you know, for, that led to all of this discussion about going back to the moon? I, I don't dive deep into the politics of it. I, I know there are some years where NASA is really excited about Mars, right? And then there's some years where we're really excited about the moon. So I don't know in depth enough what the driving factor was to get us back there. And who knows what it will be two years from now. We're always kind of on this oscillating pattern of whichever way the political spectrum drives us or wherever the public interest is at the time. Do you think if NASA got their way that we would go to Mars or is it just a logistical nightmare? I think we're getting closer. The things that are hard are, you know, getting there and getting back, keeping life sustained once we're there, dealing with the dust on Mars. A lot. Of, how do you land a rover or land a machine on there where it's just going to get really dirty? And there, there are lots of different challenges. And in the past 10 to 15 years, we've made a lot of great strides on. And I, I can't speak on behalf of NASA. This is just my observation as sure. somebody who's really enthusiastic about space exploration. But I don't think it's a waste at all. And I think NASA 100% would go for it tomorrow if we could. Is, is there anything about working there that would probably surprise people? I think... The extreme climate of Mars is not well known to the public. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of temperature factors we have to take into consideration. The dust thing, I mentioned that earlier. Dust is, if you work in the Mars area, you don't, dust is scary, scary. It gets all over everything. And that makes all of our Earth-based technology 
Or here, we're just used to things settling to the ground, right? We've got proper gravity. Right. And trying to get around that, it's a bigger nuisance and inconvenience than it should be. And I, that's pretty surprising, I think. Is, is that a concern that, like, if they bring a ship to there, that it would cause, like, dust storms and stuff like that, and that the visibility would be difficult? Those are temporary. Those, that, those are factors. There are other concerns. There's this robot or a machine. What's the name of it? I think Moxie. And it takes carbon dioxide from the air. And the majority of Mars' atmosphere is made up of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And this robot was on Mars, and they launched this machine, Moxie. And it takes that carbon dioxide and uses the technology to turn it into oxygen. And when that little rover is driving around the surface or when it's sucking in air, the dust becomes problems for things like that. You've got... You don't have passive systems when your balance of plants is around those technologies. You have valves and pumps and all these parts where little small particles like to settle. I see. So, you know, you also said that uh, growing up, you were concerned about uh, the environment and and you're also involved with a startup that's going to do something about climate change. Can you want to talk a little bit about that? I can. That was a whole new world for me. I have always done science and engineering. My brain thinks like a scientist. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I realized I'm doing all this stuff about carbon dioxide in space. What am I doing here about it on planet Earth? Because it's also a problem down here. Right. And the answer was nothing. And the idea kind of grew from that. And I really wanted to do something. If you if you want to tackle a problem one of the best places to start is looking at what's already been done. More than likely, you're not the first person to ever think of something. And if you are, you are way smarter than me. Congratulations. (laughs) But you should start doing your due diligence and your research and see what people are working on. Figure out what's going right, what's going wrong, how you could help, and what resources and skills you have to contribute. So I started there. And I learned for carbon capture, and that's when you remove carbon dioxide that's already in the air. There are no technologies that exist at the individual level. So if I were to tell you, Jim the Sherpa, to reach next to you right now and grab a a molecule of carbon dioxide from the air, you've, you've got nothing to help you. All of the tools are at the industrial level. And it all grew from there. I really wanted to give individuals the ability to participate in carbon capture as well. So I started this company with that objective, with zero business experience, and had to learn all that world in parallel with my dumb business brain, smart science brain, is what I like to like to say. <laughs> and I realized I had to come up with a technology to accomplish my goal. And from there, we invented what we call this carbon capture paint. It's a non-toxic, all-natural paint that removes carbon dioxide directly from the air. And the cool thing about it is you don't have to be an artist or scientist to use it. We've applied it on fences, brick walls, cement walls, DIY, DIY projects like gardening pots. It's really applicable. And all you have to do is move a paintbrush. The science does the rest itself. It took me about... Two to three years to develop it. There were a lot of trial and error steps. There were a lot of failures in getting the recipe right. Late nights of pizza stains running down my shirt from that process. (laughs) But we finally did it. We actually just launched the paint to the world a few weeks ago. We have a kickstarting effort running to until May 20th to try to get everything out there and get people on board. So that's where we're at right now. And it's really exciting. So we can understand this a little bit better. Let's just say for argument's sake, you're you're in the backyard and you have a fence and you use this paint on the fence. It's going to draw the CO2 out of the air and, and onto the fence. Is that what's going to happen? It, 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 does it, it draws it like a magnet. Is that how it works? Or does, yeah, it you're, it up? does it break it down to other elements? You're thinking like a scientist. So we, we like Uh-oh. to. This, no, this is good. I encourage this. Actually, I appreciate what I call constructive criticism or thoughtful questions. But you apply it to the paint, you apply the paint to the fence, 
And we like to say that it drinks the carbon dioxide out of the air. It breathes the carbon dioxide in. There's an ingredient in the paint called olivine. It's the most abundant rock on planet Earth. And when CO2 comes in contact with the olivine, it naturally sticks to its surface and undergoes a reaction. And when it reacts with the olivine, it transforms into this really harmless, benign product, similar to, let's say, limestone. You physically don't see any changes in the paint. The color doesn't change. The texture doesn't change. But the CO2 chemistry happens. It's locked in place. It transforms into something that's not bad for the environment. So all around, it's a win-win. That's interesting. That was actually going to be my next question. Would you would you see a physical change on the fence if the paint was on it? But you're saying no. I guess it's probably on like a on a microscopic level, but it's still gra- grabbing a lot of it. That's exactly right. Everything happens at the microscopic level to our human eyes. I, I wish we could see that tiny. The world would be even more fascinating. But to our to our boring human eyes, we we don't have that level of in depthness. This could probably be used, uh, I guess, like on a wider level by like businesses and and ultimately, like you said, for home use. Like you said, if you you know were, were to paint a fence or or something, you know, in, in a person's house or on their yard or something like that. Yep, yep. We're hoping the more surfaces we get this paint on, the more of an impact we could have. So we're going after everything. Put it on your house, put it on your fence. We've had people paint their mailboxes with it. We've painted, we've collaborated with local city governments to paint fire hydrants. We've collaborated with artists to do murals. We have businesses who have reached out about it. We don't discriminate about who uses the paint, and we encourage everybody to use it. Okay. And for the folks that aren't too well-versed in science, when we're taking that CO2 out of the air, what what ultimately will that do for for planet Earth? It's going to help global warming. So part of what's happening is our our planet is getting warmer. And I'll I'll try to... break this down without using too many boring boring science words. <laughs> but the sun the sun is our primary energy source for Earth, for the Earth, Earth's climate. And the sunlight, it beams through the uh, air and it's reflected directly back into space, especially by surfaces such as ice and clouds. And the rest of it is sucked up or absorbed by the surrounding air. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of that absorbed solar energy, it's readmitted or sent back out as heat. And then the, the air in turn absorbs and then radiates that heat. And then some of that escapes to space. Anyhow, I, I could keep going on about the science stuff, but any disturbance in that balance, it affects the way the, the climate is. And it makes the surface much warmer because it's absorbing and emitting that heat energy in all sorts of directions. So the less interferences we have, such as carbon dioxide in the air, the better. So not to get into like a political discussion or debate or anything like that, what's the best way to say to someone that, you know, there are people who feel that global warming doesn't exist? I I mean, as a scientist, what's your best argument so that people could maybe even just understand it rather than just getting into some sort of silly argument? You know, here's where I've, found my inner peace with that and come to terms with that. There's lots of facts on the internet. And I could tell you all of the, not you personally, but those people, Mm -hmm. all all those facts until I'm blue in the face, but it's going to mean nothing. They've, They've already made up their mind. And unless they are physically experiencing a hardship or something traumatic that they can directly correlate to climate change somehow more than likely they're not going to change their mind. So where I'm at and where I found my peace, there, there are vocal people and activists and organiz- great organizations trying to get the message out there and deliver facts to people who do not believe in it. Mm-hmm. I've decided whether or not somebody believes in climate change, I don't need their belief to take action. I could still try to do something about it. Right. So rather than putting my energy into yelling facts into the universe or trying to change somebody's mind, I'm still just going to make these technologies and take action in my own way. And hopefully that'll make a difference. Right. And even what you're doing, even for argument's sake, if it didn't exist, what you're doing still isn't harming the atmosphere anyway. It's just going to make it 
cleaner. So, I mean, <laughs> there's really nothing where I can say, well, what you're doing is wrong. So there's really nothing wrong with what you're doing. And that was one of the reasons we chose paint. I wanted to use something that's already integrated into our daily lives. It's right. harder to get people to adapt to a completely new idea, something they've never heard of. So I'm hoping it's a little easier by saying, just use this one instead of that one. What do you got to lose? And what we're trying to do also is scale it to a point where the price of our paint is actually cheaper than the paint you can get in the stores. Mm -hmm. And that could be an incentive as well. Maybe you don't want to use it because of all the climate change stuff that you don't believe in, but maybe you'll use it because it's cheaper. Who knows? And maybe even ultimately it could become the... the uh the thing that you're adding to the paint, maybe that might ultimately become like a standard for any outdoor paint. Yep. Or maybe one day it'll become some sort of tax credit the way if you get solar panels on your roof. Lots of right. possibilities there to incentivize people to use it. Absolutely. So if people want to learn more about this, is there a website or anything where they can go to, to find out about this? Or right now, is it still just kind of in the uh, Kickstarter phase? I am splattered all over the internet. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> okay. the Kickstarter, I think it's called, ooh, I should know this off the top of my head, Carbon Capture Paint. Okay. Our website and all of our social medias are under the People CO2. And if you can't find us from there, maybe dig into YouTube. But I think between the words, the People CO2, Carbon Capture Paint, throw that into Google, you'll land there. We know you're going to be, you know, with NASA and you'll be working to uh, protect our atmosphere up there. And you will be working with your other job to uh, protect the air down here. Is there anything that people can do in the meantime, you know, while, you know, before this, all of this really comes to fruition and is widely used? They can. We like to remind people to be mindful about what everyone likes to call your carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And that's a little challenging because a lot of the things you would need to do interferes with our way of doing stuff. Asking somebody to bike work versus drive. Well, if you live in Houston like me on a hot summer day in August where it's 100 plus degrees and it's so <laughs> humid outside, you're taking a shower. Nobody <laughs> wants to get on a bike and drive or ride across town, right? Yeah. <laughs> that bike might melt in 100 degree weather. <laughs> So it's challenging. There are little things you can do like recycle. You could try to use sing use less single use products. You could try to use more reusable stuff, which is almost the same in the same way of thinking. But you just have to find what works with your lifestyle and try try to fit that in. I think it's a great idea. And it's something that def definitely people should be keeping in mind. So her name is Tanya Rogers, and uh, we'll we'll share that information on the show notes so uh, people will know where to go if they want to find out a little bit more information. And I want to thank you so much for coming by the show. This was fun. Thanks for letting me science ramble, Jim. I'll talk to you next time. Let's get back to the Sherpa. Sorry about that. No. A very special thanks to Tanya Rogers for swinging by the Sherpa screening room. And a very special thanks to you, too, for spending a little time and checking out this conversation. We've got new episodes pretty much coming out every Wednesday. And on Saturdays, we do Sherpa Selects and we feature the earlier episodes that you may have missed if you just started listening. And you'll see there's really like an evolution of the show. We get better and better each week and we get great, great guests and we've got more great guests coming up as well. If you're into that social media thing and you want to know what's going on with the show and see all my cute little doofy AI videos promoting the guests, uh, you can just follow me on social media. Sharpolution is the word you need. It's S-H-E-R-P-A-L-U-T-I-O-N. And Sharpolution.com is the website where it's all happening. It's got every single episode from the start until now and beyond. Got to get a good echo effect for that. Maybe one day I'll be able to afford it. But anyway, uh, I think that's all we've got to cover. And we'll be back next week. I think we're actually doing another Sherpa Screening Room episode. We will be getting back to the Too Many Podcast episodes in a matter of time. Don't worry. We've got more before this season's up. And of course, there will be more and more seasons coming your way until you can't stand me anymore. Please don't make that now. <laughs> okay, Lord Mr. Bruce. 
I think it's time to head on out of here. So all of you listening, I say thanks again. And until we meet again, viva la Sherpa Lucian. Thanks for listening to the Sherpa Screening Room. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast. I'm Mr. Bruce, and this has been a Sherpa Loose Studios production. Viva la Sherpa Lucian.